The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Summer blockbusters, art house favorites. The silver screen has something for everyone. So grab your popcorn. We're going to the movies this week with Canadian Screen Award winning director Clement Virgo, film critic and festival programmer Cameron Bailey, film critic Tom Ernst, and producer Alicia Fletcher. Tonight, are there great movies or just favorites? That's next on the agenda in the summer. I think this might be our most controversial conversation. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we, when we talk about the uh, movie canon, like the movies that everybody should watch, I think it's a very personal uh, experience, but also society, like the zeitgeist. There are movies that everyone should watch, right? For a long mm -hmm. time, I hadn't watched Star Wars, right. <laughs> but I kind of understood because everybody- It was everywhere. Everybody yeah. talked about yeah. it, right? Um, so. What would you say is the best movie of all time? Cameron, I'll start oh with you. My God. <laughs> Come on, seriously? I said it's gonna be controversial. <laughs> all right, let me just, there is no best movie of all time, obviously, right? So it's just important, like what is the best song of all time, right? It's just, it's impossible to say. Mm -hmm. We all have our favorites. If we're, if we're alive, they should change with time. Like mm -hmm. your favorite movie of all time when you're a kid is probably the one you just saw, right? <laughs> and then it'll be something else next week. So like your opinions, they should evolve Yeah, time. exactly. So there was a time when, for instance, um, a film called Sans Soleil by, the Chris, uh, by Chris Marker, the French filmmaker, was my um, top film of all time. Uh, Vertigo's been there. Um, uh, you know, Claire Denis' films um, have alternated uh, yeah. position. So I don't have one, uh, and I'm glad I don't have one. Uh, but I like that people try to make these lists and have a top <laughs> film of all time because it's just, it tells you that you're at least interested in watching and assessing films. And people care about this yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Tom? Brother. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well played. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, my, my taste continues to change uh, mm -hmm. over time. And uh, uh, the last time I checked, I think it was Magnolia's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really? that was yes, oh. and and but, but Paul Thomas Anderson still does it for me. I thought Licorice Pizza was just wonderful. I saw it like four or five times. Can you say the thing that makes it? You know, they're sprawling, and and they uh, they they pack a lot of different emotions, and and uh, he doesn't sort of focus, except maybe with. Uh, um, Punch Drunk Love. And Punch Drunk Love, which actually mm -hmm. is so good. And when I saw that, interesting enough, mm -hmm. two critics I saw it at the film festival got into a fight. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see it. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, anyway, uh, so I just think his films are, are, are sprawling. There's a lot of different emotions he uses. Uh, he's very subtle in some things and very, very to the point. And uh, Boogie Nights was very much on. Mm. It, it hit every button, where something like licorice pizza is very subtle throughout. Mm. So I like licorice yeah. pizza. Mm. I don't know. It, mine changes all the time. You know, it depends mm. on my mood. It, you know, now the film that kind of pops into my head is The Seven Samurai, mm. at Karasawa. Mm. Um, whenever I, I make a film, the, that's a film I always watch first. What is every that? Time. What is the thing? Can you name the thing? It's it's just the. The mastery of the film, the poetry of the film, the you know the control of it, um, the way he uses the environment, you know, like the, the wind and the rain and the and the sounds, you know, um, and you know, there's a beautiful moment where the one of the samurais run up, grabs a flag and it runs up to the top of the house and he plants it and it's such an emotional, beautiful moment. Um, is that what you mean too when you say poetry? Yeah, because because I think that cinema for me is beyond words, you know, it's it's all about a kind of visceral experience of um, just a, an image telling me everything about it. Mm -hmm. about the movie. And if it stays with you. And if it stays with mm -hmm. me over time. Alicia? 
I, I think I'm with Cameron. I don't have a favorite film, but if there was a gun to my head, it <laughs> might be Paddington 2, and I would like oh, to not yeah, follow yeah. that up with any comment. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think a lot about, uh, there's Letterboxd is a really great app mm. for movie lovers, and they ask you to get your top four, and then they use that to kind of rate what you might like. And when I look at my top four, only I did it because I had to. Mm -hmm. uh, Red Shoes is a huge mm -hmm. film for me, mm -hmm. and I think it's because it's about, um, it's the Powell and Pressburger film from mm -hmm. the 1940s. It's about passion and the danger of being passionate about something and being in love with a talent that you have, and I think movies about that really attract me. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca, Hitchcock's Rebecca, mm -hmm. and then I would say on kind of a side, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Thread, which to me is almost yes. a remake of Rebecca in some ways. But anything that's gothic or maybe there's a lady trapped in the attic mm -hmm. probably is going to suck me in. And I love Technicolor. The film can be bad, but mm -hmm. if it has a color palette that I dream about at night, mm -hmm. it tends to make my list. It's so, so beautiful. Yeah. I actually love what there, you just yeah. said. Yeah. Uh, about Paddington 2? Everything. <laughs> Starting with Paddington 2, bold choice. But other things as well, because I think you're right. There's something about uh, not the quality of the film, but the 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 kind of the visual, the the, the yeah, the, the tactility. And for me, yeah, so color for me is a big thing as well. Composition, yeah. movement, you know, all of those things are yeah. a big thing for me as well. But I think I, if I detect it in your list of four, there's something about a kind of a perverse passion. Yeah. Yes, that seems wow. to yes. appeal to you. And for yes. me. It's also a kind of a thread, common thread of melancholy, right? Mm -hmm. I love, um, I love Vertigo, also perverse passion and melancholy. Mm -hmm. I love In the Mood for Love. Mm -hmm. I love Wong Kar Wai's mm -hmm. films generally because they all have that sense of beautiful sadness, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. and that's what I, I yeah. tend to gravitate to. And most of us have a, an emotion that's our our strongest lead emotion when it comes to movies, and then that's how our, our movies line up. Yeah. So do you think maybe we get a better understanding of who we are with the movies that we like? Absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. You can tell a lot yeah. about a person by what their favorite yeah. movies are. And you can you can learn to run quick if someone gives you the wrong title. Yes. I do have, a, I have my top four, and then I have my top four on a date if someone were to say that this is their favorite film, I'm escaping. Yeah. Tom? I just wanted to change my favorite film title. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm it's my brother. It is brother, <laughs> but then followed closely by, uh, by uh, Paths of Glory. Paths oh, of Glory. Yeah, yeah. and Kubrick. I can, and, and the Kubrick. Re Kubrick almost. But because I had read uh, somebody's list uh, uh, in you know, t you know some film magazine, Sight and Sound perhaps, and they discussed the scene. I have not seen the movie yet. They discussed the scene of uh, uh, is it uh, 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 Kerry Jr. I forgot his first name. Um, Anyway, he's he's one of the condemned men walking up and going, why not him? Why not him? Mm. Wondering why he's being executed. And that moment of the film just mm. is beautiful. Well, speaking of lists, uh, we, we have uh, in 2022, Sight and Sound tried to answer the question of what is the best movie of all time. And mm -hmm. we have a clip from it. <laughs> So part of the title of that movie is Jean Diamant and looking at that and thinking that is the best movie of all time. First, mm -hmm. have any of you seen this movie? Of course, movie? yes, oh. multiple yeah. times, yes. Pro is it the best? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. Oh, I mean, I'm I gonna voted say in that probably poll. yes. I put, so it, did I. I put it number two. Uh, where did you, do you didn't have it at all on your list? I, I didn't have it at all on my list. Okay, Alicia? I didn't vote, it's, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's up there. I mean, I've programmed it a number of times. It's one of my most special films and it's Why? a- I don't know of another film that's ever done something as bold as that. And when bold, I bold, but when you look at that scene, I haven't seen the whole I, thing. I do understand. It just seems yes. so mundane. Like I do that every day. It's the mon it's the mundane parts that build up. This is a horror film in some ways. This has a crescendo and a conclusion. 
that can rip a theater apart. Can you explain the premise of that? I don't want to spoil it, to be yeah. honest, because yeah. I really do want people watching the show to maybe seek it out. So uh, maybe I can just say a, a, a couple of things about it. For people yeah. who haven't yes. seen it, we yeah. show it every now and then at Tip the Light Box. Yeah. I try to get it in there at least once every year or two. It's the story of a woman who lives in Brussels in Belgium, and the title is her name and her address. So that tells you already that it is a, a, just about her life. Mm. And it is a life of um, what seems like domestic drudgery. We see her do the things that a housewife of her time and place would do every day. But it does build to this crescendo, I'm not going to spoil it either, mm -hmm. that is part of the point. Uh, it's, very, it's made by a, a, a filmmaker named Chantal Ackerman a feminist filmmaker who was interested in the way women's lives in particular were constrained and then what that constraint did to women. And that is the story and that's why it is a horror movie. It's a lot of repeated action. It's over three days. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we saw that clip where she's, I think, beating some veal cutlets and making a meal. And you see that routine over and over again, but you watch as she shifts, as her mentality shifts. And it's as simple as on that third day, a piece of her, she has perfectly coiffed hair. Mm -hmm. One piece of hair just unravels and then you know everything's gonna be different. Mm -hmm. And that's the moment where you realize something horrible is going to happen. And it's a, a movie about details. Chantelle Ackerman is a master. I mean, that goes without saying. And she was so young when she made this film, mm -hmm. so young with a mostly female crew at a time when that was unusual. And it just did something on film they had never seen before. I, I showed it, I used to do a series at the Royal called Ladies of Burlesque, and it mm -hmm. paired burlesque performance with movies, normally Marilyn Monroe, what you would expect. I don't know why I thought to show Jean Dillman. That was a mm -hmm. very, I remember thinking, maybe I shouldn't do this. But we had burlesque performers engage with the film and do the repeated actions and drink mm -hmm. a milk glass mm -hmm. of milk very slowly and play with a pair of scissors. And mm -hmm. it was haunting. Mm -hmm. It's a very haunting film. And I think I saw it before I understood what experimental cinema was, but I was riveted. And it's three and a half hours. You want, now I want to watch it, but I remember you were like, no. <laughs> so why do you say no? Um, look, it's a beautiful film and I've seen it a, a number of times. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a powerful film. But I think it's a kind of film that critics put on lists mm. as a number one. It's a great film. I'm not taking anything away from the film because I've seen it a number of times. But, um, you know, I, I think that when you're asked to make a list, mm. you know, you have, your, you have your, your real list and then you have the list that y you think you should make. Like a performative? A performative list. And I think this title... Stacking it. Yes, this title is... Is, again, it's a fantastic film, mm -hmm. um, but it's a performative. What is its signal if you have it on your it, list? It, yes. I'm going to tell you why <laughs> that's important, because the Sight and Sound list started in 1952, okay. and they did it every 10 years. The most recent one was 2022. And every time they did it, for decades, there were no women, women right. on None. the list, yeah. right? Not, not one. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, we're in a different time now. And the, yes. the time between... Um, 2002 and 2022 and 2012, you know, a lot changed in the debates around cinema and issues of representation and underrepresented filmmakers became so important. So I completely get why Absolutely. suddenly Jeanne Dielman just rocketed to the top of that list. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe there was some element of performative uh, voting in that. <laughs> but then every list has that, right? The people who name, you know, an Ozu film, Tokyo Story, do they all love Tokyo Story <laughs> or do they just feel like they should. <laughs> you, you know, know who's been quiet about this is Tom. Yeah. Have you watched this? Oh, or... Well, see, I have purposely, <laughs> with great intent, uh, decided to wait until Cameron programs it next. <laughs> All right. Yeah, right. this is the year I will see this film. I, um, I collect, maybe not surprisingly, I collect movie posters, and mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to buy a Jean Dielman one sheet, which are quite rare because it's theatrical. Mm -hmm. 1975 release basically was non-existent. Mm -hmm. It was expensive, I want to say like 600 US. This was years ago and I was like, no way. Mm -hmm. And then I looked up what it was worth a week after that list. 6,000, right. 10,000, wow. because there's, there's not many. And then mm -hmm. that list and that film being at the top all of a sudden made it so important in a way that it mm -hmm. wasn't, it was just for cinephiles before, but now yeah. it's all part of the conversation. 
And I think that's great. That's also not the only Chantal Ackerman on that Sight and Sound. There's News from Home. Mm -hmm. That's a great film. Which well, I love, absolutely love. And I remember going to see Joker mm -hmm. at the festival mm -hmm. and my jaw dropped when the director of that, Todd Phillips, told you that he was inspired by Chantal Ackerman's yeah. News from yeah, Home. I remember just being like, too. hold the phone. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening here? But there's been a yeah. major shift with Ackerman, um, I think as a result of her death. Mm -hmm. And she, she died a number of years ago, five or six years ago, and it was very tragic. And I think we, then we started reassessing her films and seeing that she's not on lists. She's not being right. programmed in the way that she should be. Uh, and that's important. So yes, it's probably stacked. I think you're absolutely right. But I think it's with the right intentions because mm -hmm. I don't need Citizen Kane to be number no. one anymore. I know, yeah. I yes. know it. Yeah. Uh, with that being said then, should we revere classics? Should classic movies be on everybody's canon? i.e. Citizen Kane, which has been mentioned a couple times. I think if you're going to be in the industry uh, and call yourself a critic or call yourself uh, uh, even a fan, yes. Even fans should have? Well, I guess fans, we can, you know, they might have a genre that there's, uh, you're focused on. But if you're going to be working within the industry, uh, whether an actor, director, or film critic, whatever, yes, there should be certain films that you have uh, as I, you know, as artillery. Mm -hmm. you know, Which uh, ones, though? Give us well, I think that, you know, okay, I, I can tell you how that, that I don't think I'm necessarily the one to, to choose them, but I think that what I look for to are directors uh, who have established themselves as, uh, you know, phenomenal within, you know, in the industry. I think academics, uh, I think they have the ability to do that. And uh, I think certain film critics. But you mentioned that she wasn't, um, Ackerman wasn't on lists, women I mean, weren't on lists. In a corner of yes. film yeah. studies, yeah. Like feminist yeah. film studies, she was always, you know, mm -hmm. very high on the list, but for the most part, ignored by in other corners. Does it matter who's picking the list then? It oh, always okay. matters, yes. Yeah. 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 Of course yeah. it does, yes. Everything. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's why I think lists change, right? So mm -hmm. you look at the sight and sound list from the 50s and 60s, it's very different than it is in more recent years. Um, you know, at a certain point, Hitchcock was not as revered as he was right. when these lists were started, and that that happened largely because of you know French film critics and other a auteur critics who valued his his work as a director, even though he's making very mm -hmm. commercial films. What's happening now and needs to happen more is that the global range of cinema is expanding, and you know a canon and films that are important to watch are no longer just. Hollywood films or films from Western Europe, mm -hmm. but they're also, and not just films from Japan either. That was always a part of the traditional canon. Enough, right. But you need to watch the films of Epi Chapong from Thailand and other film, filmmakers from all over the world. And I think those things matter. You need to watch queer films, feminist films, films by women, films from, um, you know, uh, Zach Rice Canuck from um, Nunavut. Uh, those films have entered the canon because people keep pushing against the canon. Mm -hmm. You need to stretch it, right? It mm -hmm. can never feel like it's fixed. Mm -hmm. Alicia? Yeah. Yeah, I think looking at something like Letterboxd and accessibility to these films, when I was trying to build my own canon as an 18 or 19 year old at a blockbuster, it was how many <laughs> criterions do they have on disc? And mm -hmm. I started at one because they're all numbered on their spine and I, that's how I taught myself film until I could learn to unbreak that, to break that canon. Mm -hmm. But today, through the, whether it's streaming, a lot of young people have more access than we did to the films you're talking about, to a pitch a pong. And that's so exciting that I think that's what's changing the list mostly is that it's kind of the curtain's been pulled away. Mm -hmm. Like it's now much more democratized and also looking at who's voting on those lists, that was a very different set of film critics than 10 years prior, vastly different. It's a really good place that we're in, partially thanks to streaming, mostly I wanna say thanks to places like TIFF Cinematheque and mm -hmm. places that can still run these films in theaters with audiences, but if you're somewhere where you don't have access to that, the fact that you can get in a pitch a pong maybe through your public library, mm -hmm. streaming is very exciting. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I look at my own journey as a filmmaker. I started off watching, you know, like I said, Hong Kong fil films from Hong Kong and Westerns and so forth. And then you you slowly expand and, and you discover things. You, it, then I discovered the French New Wave and then I discovered f films from South Korea. And then, you know, you, you're constantly as an artist um, 
realizing that the history of cinema is, is huge and vast and, and there's so much to take from various places. Um, so, you know, I would encourage anyone who wants to be a filmmaker to, yes, you have to study the classics. You, yes, look at Citizen Kane, mm -hmm. right? But, but then you also have to look at Andrew Arnold and Fish Tank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's so cool because I keep thinking of uh, like Nollywood. Uh, it's mm -hmm. like such a huge industry now. Mm -hmm. Years ago, if you watched a Nollywood movie, you'd see like the boom mic, people mm -hmm. walking behind. But people love those movies. Yeah, but I think it also had to do with representation. Like they Absolutely. could see themselves on screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nollywood movies are now much bigger budget, many of them, mm -hmm. and are premiering at film festivals or on big streaming platforms, mm -hmm. and are working with you know a, a level of professionalization, if that's significant. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they didn't have before. Well, it seems as if picking a canon is a very personal thing. You have the ones that everybody talks about, and you would also want to be part of the conversation. But um, what do you think the role of awards and best of lists, are they useful in helping us to build our canon? I think oh. absolutely both festivals and uh, uh, awards are, are, are useful, and not just to pick a a canon of films, but mm -hmm. and also in uh, illuminating films that otherwise might not be illuminated. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I think a lot of people look at awards as uh, frivolous and uh, self-congratulatory, and uh, I, I don't necessarily see it that way. Um, um, there's certainly the the pomp about it that that makes it look that way, but I think how many people would have have uh, uh, seen Coda? whether you like it or not, how many people would have been aware of that film mm -hmm, yeah. or other films? Um, so it helps, I think, with uh, building a personal canon. Uh, and I also think both festivals and awards help uh, illuminate smaller films. Mm -hmm. Can I just give one example? Mm -hmm. um, Agnes Varda, French filmmaker, who was um, part of the very beginnings of the French New Wave, even before the French New Wave was the French New Wave. She made one of the very first features and was a part of that whole circle of filmmakers with Godard and Truffaut and Rene and others. Um, she was a woman, one of the few women in that circle, did not get the due that some of her male counterparts did. Mm -hmm. In the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years of her life, things changed remarkably because there were just different people watching her films, yeah. writing about her films, being inspired by her films, a young generation of feminist critics, um, started a magazine called Cleo after mm -hmm. the title of uh, one of her films. Um, and, and then by the time she passed, she was a legend, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. she should, it should have been 50 years earlier, but it happened. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is, is, is sort of how canons work. She's now firmly entrenched there, mm -hmm. but the time wasn't right because of all of the different, you know, social currents for her to actually be recognized mm -hmm. until she was in her 80s. Oh. Yeah, I would just, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, to that point, I think the canons, uh, I, I, I look at filmmakers as a, a canon and, uh, and their works as opposed to individual films. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, whether you, you know, they're problematic, but I would say look at John Ford films, you know, uh, uh, look at, at Truffaut films and and whatever, as as opposed to specific filmmaker yeah. uh, films. Yeah, and, and and also just different periods, right? I mean, as cinema has all these different periods: the silent era, yeah. the sound era, you know, post-war, you know, the, um, you know, the Italian realism, you know, French New Wave, uh, the the so-called black exploitation films, you know, so there's all these different areas that um, filmmakers could look at. And uh, when we talk about canons, Alicia, what about black and white films? That's interesting. I, I don't really think of it necessarily as should they be in the canon. Mm -hmm. They're not really a genre. Just some filmmakers decide even today to make films in black and white. And actually, it's probably a lot harder and more expensive if you choose to make a film in black and white today. Mm -hmm. But there is definitely a stigma of black and white. I think you were talking about earlier, Cameron, uh, that films are primitive, or if it doesn't have mm -hmm. the most cutting edge technology, then it's bad. It's just not true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be black and white. It could be early Technicolor, which mm -hmm. looks very different than how we think of yeah, color film today. It's, sure. There's no blues, it was mm -hmm. red and green, and it almost looks like you're wearing weird 3D glasses. Like, all of those films are still stories that are worth telling mm -hmm. and worth absorbing. You just have mm -hmm. to give it a chance. But to be like a mm -hmm. true cinephile, do you need to know those black and white films? Yes. I mean, yes. 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 I, mean, <laughs> I, 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 I would not like to meet someone who says they're a cinephile, but they've never seen a black and white film. <laughs> that would crazy. be <laughs> deeply, <laughs> deeply upsetting to me. But then I would also want to, well, listen, buddy, I'm going to show you some black and white films, and you're going to have a great amazing. time. 
someone brought a six-year-old to uh, when I showed Passion of Joan of Arc, and I remember introducing it and locking eyes with that six-year-old and being like, <laughs> I'm in trouble. What's going to happen here? Like, maybe the parent just thought, oh, it's an old movie, it'll be fine. And there's, like, bloodletting, and it's mm. a very visceral, yeah. violent film. But they sat through two hours of that movie, and they did not budge, and they were interested in it afterwards and I couldn't believe that we only have a couple minutes left and uh, because we've spent the week with you I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say anything about movies that you haven't had uh, mm. the chance to say Tom I'll start with if you. you start with me you know I'm <laughs> gonna change my mind <laughs> um, I, I, yeah the one thing I will say yeah. is that uh, when you're talking about uh, uh, introducing film etc people that is one of the the, the pure joys of my uh, uh, profession mm -hmm. is that is is not writing critiques etc which can be fun but it is introducing cinema to people and and uh, uh, I got to do that at TVO and I think I get to do it in my my personal life there's nothing better I love even my tenant downstairs will phone me up and say what movie should we watch mm -hmm. and I just love being able to say this is a great film mm -hmm. watch it let me know what you think and then talking about it afterwards mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the kind of wrap-up you meant but that's <laughs> what I, I would like to be. Uh, I would say all the mysteries of life can be answered in the cinema oh mm, that's wow. deep that's mm. a good one mm. Alicia that's hard, that is hard <laughs> follow to that follow up. but I would encourage people to write down what they absolutely think they hate about films or genres mm -hmm. And then find what is on a list of the best and go see that. Mm -hmm. Just challenge yourself, have an open mind. I thought I hated musicals and then started watching musicals. I was like, I love musicals. So I didn't know that. It's it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And Cameron, I'll let you have the last word. Oof. Um, it's been an amazing conversation. Um, I'm lucky enough in my work that I've been able to travel to see movies and to meet filmmakers as well. And you know, been on set in Manila with a filmmaker and, you know, um, townships in South Africa or riding a taxi in, in Mumbai and everybody in Mumbai can talk to you about movies, which is amazing. It's one of the richest film cultures in the world. Mm -hmm. And what I love about that is that it's a common language, a common culture that is shared in every corner of the planet. And it, it all comes down to the same thing, a kind of a personal emotional reaction you have that you don't fully have words for that happens mm -hmm. in front of this beautiful art form. Mm -hmm. And wherever you go in the world, you can find people who have that same experience. I absolutely love that. Oh, I don't want to mess it up by talking <laughs> after that. <laughs> but this is this experience is going to stay with me for a very long time. I've learned so much. And it's been such a privilege to be able to like talk about this from people that understand this industry, but also your hearts, mm -hmm. you know, it's imprinted on your hearts. So thank you so much for being so generous. Oh, thank we you. appreciate yeah. it. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Our guests all this week were director, producer, and writer Clement Virgo, whose most recent film, Brother, won the Canadian Screen Award for Best Picture. Cameron Bailey, CEO of the Toronto International Film Festival. Alicia Fletcher, producer of Originals and Curatorial Advancement at Hollywood Suite. And film critic Tom Ernst, formerly host here of Saturday Night at the Movies and author of The Wild Boy of Wobbamick. Next week, The Mysteries of the Cosmos. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. 